Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 25th day of November in the year of our Lord, 2023. And I'm just a fountain of videos the last couple days here. Just get one done and something else pops up for me to comment on. That I And I'm going to be even-handed here now that I've gone after the Bickelites, the acolytes of Michael Bickel. Uh, well, I'll go after somebody more to my taste in some ways, but it's, it's important too. So let's start with Scripture here. That way I get it in before everybody tunes out, which they sometimes do. All right, uh, so this is uh, the epistle of Paul to the church at Colossae, uh, chapter 2, starting at verse 6. <laughs> Let me move that over so it's easier to get closer to the camera there. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, and buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. I'm going to stop there. Go back. Verse 8. You don't have to stop there. You can go back and read the whole chapter. You don't want to miss out all those good things. I am just so amazed you know, at the wealth we have in the New Testament, and I'm very disappointed at preachers that like to preach out of the Old Testament. It simply doesn't hold a candle to the glorious light of the New Covenant. Verse 8 again, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. All right. I almost hate to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to do it anyway. Okay, there's a, a young man on internet, the internet. He's been doing videos since at least 2009. Back in the days when he could barely grow some fuzz on his chin. And, uh, well, let's me go over to his, his video, uh, YouTube page here. Dr. Jordan B. Cooper, and yes, he's now a doctor. Uh, and our website, jordanbcooper.com, and he's the head of some kind of ministry. Uh, he worked in college. Can't, well, he was, uh, his early videos, he hadn't graduated yet. He was still playing with uh, rosary beads. He's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a Lutheran. Rosary beads and a yo-yo. And I, I noticed that one of those videos is still up. Yes, yeah, he's had, done a lot of videos over the year. And I've, I've been watching him about that long, okay? So, and he graduated from a seminary, and then he went to do a, uh, became a pastor at a church that's not very far from me. It's only, I don't think it's an hour from here, really. Small town. I've driven by it many times. I When he was there, I was almost tempted to go up and uh, have a word with the young man. Um now, he's an inter interesting character. However, I've been concerned about him, and that concern has not disappeared. And it's based on what we just read, my concern. He's one of these characters that's in love with philosophy and theology. And he just posted a video. And the title of this video, posted eight hours ago, got 331 views. Well, that's pretty good for me. It, it's I'm only beginning to get up where I get in that range, unless I hit the hit a home run or something on something that 
people want to watch. Oh, by the way, somebody, I'll, I'll get to that. And I got another video I want to do after this one. Try to keep this one short and to the point here. <sighs> so this is toward a comprehensive theological anthropology. RF Widener as our as a guide. Okay, so when he's talking about he's talking about this book, which is the. Con, uh, Concordia, Lutheran's Confessions, and in here is the Formula of Concord. You see the back of this book? That's pretty much the Formula of Concord, which was not written until 1580. Luther died in 1546. How do I know that? I just looked it up. It's in the book. It has a lot of description, a lot of content. And, uh, for example, if I wanted to become a member of the the church that I've attended a couple of times, and I do like the preaching, and I like the preacher. He's very Christ-centered, and we had some very interesting short conversations. He was almost late for church. But the LCMS, Lutheran Church and Missouri Senate, they are awfully sectarian, and he can't do anything about that. But it's like I would be excluded from communion unless I could agree with this in toto. This the formula the this the book of Lutheran confessions, extra biblical material. Let's see. Do they have? They have some nice, pretty pictures in the back. This is this is alert. Uh, this comes from Concordia Press, which is uh, the Lutheran Church Missouri Center Press. They are the second largest Lutheran denomination in the United States, and they have held fast on the authority of Scripture. Where are those pictures? Lots of dead men in here. Where is where is a picture of Luther? They got a picture of Calvin, too. Uh, and it, and it, it has all kinds of things in there what, about what's wrong with Calvinism and what's wrong with the Anabaptists and what's wrong with this and what's wrong with that. Uh, Philip Melanchthon, a picture of him. There, there's a picture of Luther right there. You know, that's probably the iconic picture of Martin Luther before he got older and grumpier. He didn't actually get that old. Uh, he had poor health because of his days as a monk and trying to earn salvation through monkery, which is what he called it, monkery. So, uh, the historic, useful historic world, word. Hmm. I'd like to have a book of, of some of his memes. <laughs> I don't know if I'd want to use them, but it's just fun. Uh, I don't think I'd want to use them on the internet, though. I would rather see Catholics saved than Catholics offended. Uh, sometimes with Luther, Luther wasn't quite so clear. He had a personality, let's say. A personality that fit right in on Twitter with memes. And he's a man that could do a meme. A mean meme. Some of the, the, the cartoons that were produced by Luther and his followers against the papacy. <laughs> well, they could get you banned on YouTube, maybe. So, anyway, we're going to look at this, this uh, Dr. Jordan B. Cooper, who just, and again, I, I, I've been watching this guy before he graduated and back when he was playing with Rosary Peds. Which I had, until I saw that, I had no idea that such stuff existed among Lutherans. The denomination I was raised in, the ALC, uh, yeah, and, and was confirmed in and everything else, and and it was still the ALC when I went in the military, and I actually tried going back there for a little bit, you know, maybe preach the gospel to them, <laughs> but. That was ELCA by then. It's like, that's just a lost cause. It's like tra trying to beat a dead horse uh, to get it up off the ground. It's not going to get up. It's dead. That's the ELCA. All my interactions with them were negative. I mean, I, I gave the church library a bunch of videotapes, and they just sort of got misplaced. And you know, I tried teaching Sunday school once, and that didn't work because I wasn't with the program. Yeah, the program is death. 
and that was back when they, they was really struggling hard to get the top to get homosexuality approved in the local churches. And they managed to do it. It just takes time. They keep beating on you and beating on you and beating on you until you give in, just to get peace. It's like the, the, the people that come to your door trying to, eat, to say the sinner's prayer. You'll say it just to get them to leave sometimes. So I don't approve of that uh, technique, really. It's, it's not real. It's not, it's not the way Jesus did things, or the apostles. All right, so we're going to look at uh, Jordan Cooper's here, his video. And again, this is not, my video here will be a little bit critical, a little bit critical. This is sort of the, the opposite extreme from the Michael Bickle, the Michael Bickle end of things. Bickle the pickle end of things. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Wrong button. There we go. Oh, now I, now I got to go back. And I got to stop because my audio is wrong. Sorry about that. I had thought I had everything set. And I didn't. You know, I don't have a control room staff out there to do this. So, you know, that's like, you know, I can I tried live stream once, but I gave, I've pretty much, I've got the equipment. I can do live stream. Uh, several ways I can do live stream. But I have enough trouble handling this, let alone trying to follow comments as they're coming in on a live feed. Ah, I'd be, you know, getting comments. Where's your audio? Uh, how come I got a static screen? How come? It's, it's like I don't have enough hands and eyes and brains to handle that. I'm sort of a one task person. I do not multitask well. Women are much better at that. Okay, now I've got nothing. Oop, I don't want those buttons. Let's try it again. We'll get it. There we go. There we go. That must be Widener. presentation of today is going to be for his professor presidents of the I want to Canada skip the intro well there's a, a negative and a positive to going last the negative okay this is dr. Jordan B Cooper you know why do young men grow beards so they look like they're older than they are let's face it that's why you do it it's like in, we, we weren't when I was in the Air Force. We couldn't grow a beard; it wasn't permitted. But we could grow a mustache, so uh, you know, make you look a little older than a a. a <laughs> you know, I, I gotta tell you this story. In basic, we were required to shave every day, whether we needed it or not. Some guys just have a little, little bit of peach fuzz. They still had to shave. Yeah, I was a little older. is that you've all been sitting and listening for a while and you may be spacing out during my talk. Uh, but the positive for me uh, is that there's no one coming after me, so I can talk as long as I want. Uh, so, no, my, my presentation so is he's, um, he, maybe a, a little... He's the executive director of a, a Lutheran ministry of sort. I think... Well, I, I haven't followed him very much for a while, but he was doing some... Uh, a couple of years ago, publishing of relatively classic but unavailable Lutheran theological works, perhaps. Hmm. I don't remember Lutheranism being that theological. Oh, let me f tell you what kind of Lutheran he is too. He's a he um, and he was a minister in the one church locally here, uh, but apparently he didn't like doing ministry. Uh, that kind of real, real ministry, pastoral ministry. Uh, uh, some people have different interests. He would 
probably wouldn't have been very good at it because he's very oriented to, to abstract theology. But uh, yeah, remember, remember, he's a member of the uh, AALC. Now, the church I grew up in was ALC. AALC was an association of American Lutheran churches that didn't want to be in the American Lutheran Church and the ELCA, which is the the body they joined, the apostate non-evangelical Lutheran Church, or the the ELC evil Lutheran Church of America. <laughs> that must be what ELCA stands for. Because that's where they are. I mean, it's it's form utterly dead denomination. That there are there always are still saints. God even has His saints in those places, just like the Tenbaum sisters, uh, Corey Tenbaum and her sister, uh, that were well. You, she was. Um, what book did she write? Anyway, there's a Billy Graham movie out about her, and it's a, a book. She was quite well-known and a popular speaker into the 1970s, I think. She was a survivor of uh, one of the death camps. I don't know if it was Auschwitz or one of the others, but uh, her and her sister and her father were um, imprisoned by the Nazis. They lived in Holland, and she was protecting Jews from the Nazis, and they— eventually uh, caught them and imprisoned them. And their father, who was older, of course, died. They were fairly young women living with their father, and their father died in detention, in jail, pretty quickly. And then they were sent to a Ravensbrück concentration camp. And one of the things that Corey brings out is, oh, by the way, she warned against the idea of a pre-trib rapture. <laughs> and I pretty much know why. She says, even in the darkest places, God still brings his light. They managed to smuggle in a New Testament. She bribed a guard and managed to get a hold of a New Testament, and they became the light in that dark hellhole. So, and her sister died there, but she... By accident, by accident, they accidentally released her, and she lived to present that story for, what, maybe three decades or more after that, three or four decades after that. She was uh, well-known, well-known. Of course, that was the evangelicalism that no longer exists today. Uh, today, hardly anybody's ever heard of her, just like almost nobody's ever read Pilgrim's Progress or even heard of it. <laughs> the most famous Christian book written in English after the Bible. So here's, uh, but uh, yeah, so he's a distant relative of mine from my Lutheran days, you could say. The AALC was those churches that wisely decided not to go along with the merger, and uh, there's not too many of them. But they're out there, and they're certainly a lot better than the ELCA. They wisely chose not to go that way. But they're confessional Lutherans. They they have pulpit fellowship with the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. A little longer than it should be. I'll try to cut out some things to keep it at the right length. But for that reason, I'm probably not going to take questions. Um, but I'm happy to answer any of your questions afterwards. Well, the, the title of the talk here in the program is just Widener's Anthropology. And uh, to be clear, uh, the, the actual real topic of, of the talk here is trying to move forward in new directions in theological anthropology in a way that is faithfully confessionally Lutheran. And we're using Widener, Revere Franklin Widener, as kind of a guide to doing that. Well, it would not be accurate to say that the classical Lutheran dogmatics in the immediate post-Reformation era ignored theological anthropology entirely. The topic was not among the central concerns of Lutheran academicians in the 16th and 17th <laughs> centuries. As theology often forms in response to particular claims being contended for, the problems of post-Enlightenment materialism, post-structuralism, and post-modernity had not yet forced theologians to contend for basic theological and philosophical claims about man which they took 
Okay, I'm going to do a little interpretation of tongues here. <laughs> What's he talking about? He's saying that there, there are classical presentations in this book are no longer adequate to present a theological system that can cope with um, more than two genders and other things that are present in this world today, like the denial of the existence of God and existentialism, all the things of the modern world. So that's what, that's what he's actually saying. Uh, we have to have a system of theology that's able to handle this stuff. For granted. These current challenges include the questioning of the sex binary, the existence of the soul, the denial of there being such a thing as human nature at all. In light of these current challenges, some have attempted to move beyond older theological anthropological models, as these older approaches are criticized for being too rooted in Hellenistic categories to be relevant to the modern milieu. It might thus seem, perhaps, that we are left either to remain within the theological debates of the 17th century, and thus remaining basically irrelevant to current discourse, or to adopt some other metaphysical system by which man is to be explained that is not so beholden to classical philosophy. In opposition you know, I don't think I ever heard the word metaphysics until a few years ago. <laughs> Never remember hearing that in confirmation class. Hmm, metaphysics. I don't know if that's a word I would have remembered anyway. And nor is it a word the pastor would have tried to explain. In addition to this dichotomy, I contend for an alternative, which is rooted in the theology of Lutheran orthodoxy, while recognizing the need to develop and move forward. Confessional Lutheran theology, when done rightly, is more than a mere repetition of older formulas. The completion of the Book of Concord in 1580 was not the telos of theological history, never to be expanded in any way. Rather, the Lutheran confessions stand as the basis upon which further theological development is to be grounded. Issues such as the nature of biblical inspiration, women's ordination to the pastoral office, and the creational distinction between the sexes do not have any extensive treatment in any of the confessional documents. And when these issues have arisen since, the response, at least among confessional Lutherans, was not to abandon the confessions, nor to simply leave the question unanswered, but instead to develop a robust theological position on the basis of the theological ideas set forth within our earlier tradition. <laughs> Okay, I'm almost ashamed to say that I could understand what he was saying. I don't know if that's a good thing or not. Uh, but yeah, um, what was he saying there? Again, a little time for some interpretation of tongues. He was saying that rather than abandoning the confessions and traditions, confessions are nothing but traditions, I don't recognize the authority of any confessions because they're not biblical. They're man-made. That doesn't mean they're false. It just means they have no authority. They're not the authority of the Word of God. Uh, so, yeah, this book here. He's talking especially about the, the latter portion of it. So what he was saying is rather than simply throwing this out, what we need to do, what he's proposing, is we build on that. In other words, read them eisegetically and insert modern ideas into the original material. I think that's what he's saying. I don't know how else you could build on those unless you isolate the basic thing they're building on and then build on that. It would it'd be minimizing and then reconstructing. Try to tear it down to his foundation and build anew on top of that. But then that will not be part of the Book of Concord, which was finished in 1580. So it will have no authority either. Now, if you're going to be a Lutheran in a confessional church, you have to agree that you believe in this. That you do not deny what's in this book. Well, just pretend you're ignorant. Yeah, it's, it's, as far as I understand it, I agree everything with it, everything's in this book. Just don't read it. Just don't read it. It's not bad. I mean, it's not bad, but it's, it is not even Luther. It is not Luther. 
Now, Luther, what we just heard here with, with Dr. Cooper, Luther would have taken a stick to him and driven him out of his office. Or, not, excuse me, out of the bar, the tavern. He would have driven him out of the tavern because that was his office. That's where he did his table talks with uh, his students over a beer, a large beer, a watered-down large beer because you didn't drink anything else lest you wanted to die in Germany. <laughs> Believe it or not, even the, the amount of alcohol in relatively weak beer is sufficient for some reason, they don't really understand why, to inhibit the growth of toxic materials. It is. Beer is better for you than water in Germany. <laughs> and that's, you know, Lutherans are known to love their beer. Uh, I don't love it that much, but and I'm not really a Lutheran, but I'm, I grew up with that stuff. I mean, I really did. And when, actually, when you grow up with that, it's just like in Europe, when you grow up as wine being part of the meal, alcoholism isn't really an issue. It's just part of life is food. Alcohol is food, regardless of what you might have been taught. It is food. It's not a drug. It is food. Alcohol, we are made to handle. Our digestive systems are Livers are made to handle a moderate amount of alcohol. If it's immoderate, well, then it causes problems, long-term problems. And if you're a drunkard, well, then you're not going, you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. It's not compatible. Being a drunkard is incompatible, or a drug addict is incompatible with being a Christian. <laughs> yeah, you can't do that. Just It's a lifestyle issue. They're not compatible. The fact that you live that way means you're not in the, you're not in the kingdom of God. And it's just like a, a certain sexual practices, people that have that lifestyle, they can't be in the kingdom of God because it demonstrates they're not. You know, like these Christians that are that are arguing for acceptance as normal of homosexuals or something that are, that are that that's their lifestyle. You can no, I mean, it's not talking about temptation. Really, it's talking about those who live that lifestyle. You cannot live that lifestyle if the Spirit of God is in you. He will not let you. He will not allow it. He will not allow you to abuse his temple. Not that way. Oh, no. You would be, you know, so the people that argue for that are not saved. They, they, the Holy Spirit would not allow a saved person to live like that. It just won't happen. Doesn't mean you can't stumble, you can't fall, you can't have a momentary uh, thing, but to live, you know, that and to advocate for it, uh uh, God will not permit you to do such a thing. So, anyway, let's go over to, uh, again, back to that verse. That verse. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the t traditions of men according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Christianity is Christ. It has nothing at all to do with philosophy or metaphysics. Not especially Aristotelian metaphysics, no. It has nothing to do with that stuff. That's of the world. And much of this book is of the world. And Luther would have given Dr. Cooper a good whipping because Martin Luther, see, they would never have been able to do this stuff if Martin Luther was still around when they did it. They had to wait until over 30 years after he died. Because he had a very low opinion of scholastics, of these kind of people. He had a very low opinion of it. Luther was um what's a good word? Evangelical. He didn't put up with theological nonsense. And he understood it. He was raised as an August or he was he was an Augustinian friar and a professor at Wittenberg University. But he did not put up with this kind of nonsense at all. So 
the question is, since uh, we're not we're to be aware of that kind of stuff, for why? Because in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. How do you deal with these things? He was talking about how do we deal with with uh, non-binary sexuality. That's a soft way to put it. And these other things that we're dealing with, uh, the whether or not people have uh, a nature or, or a soul or all these things, these well, atheists. I mean, what? How do you deal with that? The way Cooper proposes is we need more philosophy and theology that is tailored to this day, and somehow to construct that on tradition, on the Lutheran tradition. And the uh, uh, formula of Concord, which is pretty extensive. Again, if you have to—I think the people that become Lutherans, they say, do you agree with the formula of Concord? Yeah. Yeah, if you say so, yeah. Did they read it? Nope. <laughs> very unlikely. Very unlikely. It'd be a very long membership class. Especially if somebody was there saying— uh, but what does this mean, and is this biblical or not? How, what does that have to do with Christ? Well, that's it. See, th this is one of the reasons why I've always had a concern about Dr. Cooper. He's not Christ-centered. Christ is not where he is. He's into theology, into dead theology, because Christ does not dwell in theology and philosophy. That's not his domain. Uh, that's what cheats people, philosophy, and empty deceit, the traditions of men. According to the tradition of men, through philosophy, according to the basic principles of the world, metaphysics, and not according to Christ. The Let's, let's go over to, <laughs> we've got to go to Romans chapter 1. Uh, but sir, I usually go to 118, but we're not going to go that far. So what does the Apostle Paul say, who is the great interpreter of Christ and the cross? He, he's the one who explains what Christ did, how it applies for us, more than anyone else in the New Testament. He is the theologian of the New Testament, the explainer of the cross. So as much as it's in me, verse 15 of chapter 1, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. The only way the people of this age can be saved is through the gospel of Jesus Christ, through faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, in the message that the Son of God came and died on a cross for the sins of the world and rose from the dead as the proof that God has given to all men that he is the one, the promised one, the Messiah. <sighs> Only through that, through faith in Christ, the Christ of the Bible, can you be saved? That is the power of God. The message, that message, that through faith in him, we are saved. Not through philosophy, not through metaphysics, not through theology. All that stuff is empty deceit. Why is it deceit? Because people imagine that that is what Christianity is about. It's not about that stuff. You could take all those books and burn them, and it would not harm the gospel of Jesus Christ at all, because the gospel's not located there. We have the proclamation of the faith delivered once for all unto the saints by the witnesses of Jesus, by his apostles, his disciples that saw him, ate with him, lived with him, saw him crucified on that cross, and then witnessed 
his, re- his resurrection. Christ, they saw the resurrected Christ, who was with them over a period of 40 days, and they saw him ascend into heaven. Christianity is based on eyewitness accounts, and the evidence that God has given to all human beings that it is true that Christ is the, is the Christ, Jesus is the Christ, is the resurrection. And the apostles were chosen to be eyewitnesses of the resurrection. So if you're not satisfied with the eyewitness accounts of people who saw the resurrected Christ, including at one time more than 500 at one time, well, you're not going to get any other evidence. If you're going looking for a sign, that is the sign. That is the only sign you'll ever get. As Jesus said, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. But no sign shall be given to them except the sign of Noah, who was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. Jesus was three days and three nights in the tomb. 